Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's amazing to see so many people come so bright and early, given all of the parties that have taken place in the last 48 hours. Uh, my name is Marissa True. I am the senior content lead at Blockhouse Inc. And I'm also the host of Tez Talks Radio, the global Tezos ecosystem podcast. But today is not about me. Uh, I am joined on stage with none other than the global vice president of Adidas' Adidas's Three Stripes studio, Erica Wicks-Sneed. How are you today, first and foremost? I'm great, and what a backdrop. I'm kind of in awe of where we are right now and getting to have this conversation with a pretty small room, but in this epic, you know, Eiffel Tower in the background, you can't beat this. Yeah, it's a bit of a screensaver, so I think, you know, all, to snap all the photos you can, send them to us later. We're probably going to want them. Um, we only have, well, now 19 minutes, so I'm very mindful of the time, and we have a lot of material to get through. But first and foremost, I think everyone is always interested in a great origin story. So can you talk to us about your trajectory into the Web3 blockchain world? Yeah, um, I guess I can also weave through a little bit of how I've, I think this, this Web3 isn't really feeling like a, a revolution to me these days. I've been part of the evolution. And my career trajectory has really been following that because it started with, um, I started a motorcycle brand. It was my very first thing I've ever done out of college. Then from there, I was able to work in action sports at Toyota, where I was helping a really big global brand try to connect with youth culture. From there, I moved over to Sony PlayStation, where I helped launch PlayStation 4. And a big part of that job at the time, Sony was like dead last in its category. And the PlayStation console and the PlayStation brand really had lost their way and wasn't resonating with the core audience it was trying to serve. And so I got to spend a lot of time really getting into why people game and what are the emotional values that come with gaming at a time that popular culture was trying to put gamers in the basement, position them as like the kind of nerds in grandma's basement playing video games, really positioning gamers as doing something that wasn't valuable to society and weren't really tapping into this like greatness and epicness that really is inside each and every one of us that truly gaming can help bring out into the forefront of how people feel and that give you that exhilaration for why you play. Then from there, um, helping to launch PlayStation 4, really helping to reignite pop culture's perception around gamers. Um, as, as that time went on, I, I joined accelerator brands, um, really accelerated tech brands. I was at Google for a while looking after um, shopping, doing some payments, fintech things that are not as sexy and fun, but building infrastructure in a lot of ways, moved over to Uber. This was during the time Delete Uber had started and that really got me into thinking about decentralization and that was really the forefront of the share economy. Um, Uber, if more than anything, if you press a button, get a ride, what it did was help empower people to make a dignified living uh, for the first time ever. And, and it also helped to teach pop culture that it was okay to get in a car with strangers, Airbnb came along, it was okay to stay in a house with a stranger. I really started to cultivate this idea of community that I think Web3 is, is starting to supercharge. So you could probably see some of these themes coming through. Then from there, I, I jumped over to PayPal and Venmo where I spent some time and part of my journey there was to establish crypto inside the PayPal wallet um, in a really friendly, easy to use, intuitive way because PayPal is such a, a global platform. At the time, I think the pandemic hit, I had a baby, I was really thinking about what next, my values were changing, what was important to me in life was changing. Um, Black Lives Matter was going on, we had finished up and kind of come around the corner of Me Too Times Up and I was really thinking about what is my impact gonna be? Where can I put my time next? And Adidas had been talking to me for probably about at nine months-ish, something like that. Ironically, I was pregnant when they'd reached out to me, and, and by the time I finally accepted the job and moved, I had a one-year-old baby. Um, but all that to say, I, I'm, I really saw the Three Stripes as the world's most iconic culture brand in the world for 75 years, right? Having pushed the forefront of some of the greatest sports heroes that we know of all time, having pushed some of the greatest creators of all time. Like, you can't also under estimate how huge their cultural importance has been in helping to push through sneaker culture or style culture, some of the emerging values that we talk about today. And, and a lot of that was uh, community, I believe, through the collection and trading of sneakers 
And a lot of that has a parallel to Web3, uh, NFTs, profile pictures. And so I think when I joined, it was about three months in that there was this email going around the company. This was around the time Elon Musk had just put out the tweet where he said, yeah, Tesla's going to start accepting cryptocurrency payments for the purchase of Tesla cars. And for some reason, that like caught everyone's imagination, and it started to catch fire inside the company, and it turned into this pretty big email chain. And then I saw some of the folks asking, well, what should Adidas be doing about this? Like, what should we be doing with cryptocurrency? And I was thinking, wow, I really need to get involved because they could really mess this up if we don't jump in and like really, really grab this thing. Um, so I started what is internally known as the Metaverse Task Force, and that was February of 2021. I think I did it in quite a traditional brand strategist way. I wrote a brief. I put out the call to invite folks who were passionate about the space, had an understanding of the space. I kept it really decentralized. Um, it opened with uh, Open Innovation Day, almost a call to the organization to just say, if you've got ideas, if you have interests in this space, email us. So we hosted an, an open hands pitch, like a cold pitch. And from there, we started to organize. Did a lot of our own ethnography, our own research, uh, started to understand like what are the passions and the values driving Web3? How can it connect to a brand like Adidas? What are those behaviors that cross over into how we're serving our consumers today at the brand? Um, and within 10 months, we launched. And I think most people might know we, our, our launch was December 21. Um, and I'm happy to, to get into that next, but that's, that's basically the journey that's gotten us to here. I think it's a very thorough overview of your career history, and I think the common thread throughout is that you've always found yourself at the forefront of helping a brand or a company really push forward when it came to emerging technologies, or at least new principles with regards to those technologies. And I like what you actually said at the very beginning, which was that you didn't really see blockchain technology as revolutionary anymore. You saw it as an evolutionary space. And I think in that regard, your work at Adidas was very much about the evolution of the company, because as you said, it's well over seven decades old. So once you had established this task force and you know you had launched in December of last, no 21 you said. Yeah. So in that year and a bit, yeah. what were the very first initiatives that you wanted to drive forward and start with? Yeah. Well when it came to building, I think number one there's a lot of myths, right? There was a lot of like people that just didn't understand the space, didn't really understand the technology. And then step one, we had a lot of people that just felt like this is not for me. I'm not gonna have time. I don't care to get educated. I it's confusing. Um, the information isn't readily available for me. It's too new. I'm just gonna sit back and wait and let somebody else tell me what to do with this. So I ran into a lot of that across the company, um, especially on the senior leadership side. What I found was the people that really were getting a, a thorough understanding of how this could impact and how transformational it could be on businesses were the youth sitting at the senior manager manager uh, levels inside the organization. And so that's why the task force was so flat. And then a lot of the job in the beginning was translating what is the corporate strategy where the corporation wants to go. And they use language like membership and customer lifetime value and experience in you know, di digital direct to consumer. You know, it was then our opportunity to take what is the business saying it's trying to achieve and how can Web3 supercharge that? How can Web3 accelerate that? And then that was really playing the role between translating what's happening in the communities, in the spaces, the trends that we're seeing. I mean, there's, the, the execs knew people were leaving Facebook, but they didn't know why. They just knew Gen Z is not on Facebook, but it wasn't until we said, well, it's because that's where grandma and grandpa are, that's where mom and dad are, we want to go talk about the stuff that's interesting to us, we're moving to Discord, we're finding our communities in Discord now, we're talking about projects that we are passionate about, where we're not going to be inundated with you know, pictures of the family showing up or asking questions about what we're doing, and they were like, oh, interesting, okay, well, why? So we were then able to lead our senior leadership down the same educational journey that we were going through, so they could understand, okay, what's driving some of these trends that they're reading in the Bain, BCG, McKinsey white papers, for instance. So there was a lot of time spent just educating across the organization and grounding it in a language that they could understand that also was very, very clearly connected to their core objectives. So we were not building this as a separate standalone passion project. It's, it's part of why, from the beginning, this wasn't a marketing activation for us either. 
So along that vein, you know, as we've already established, Adidas has been around for a very long time. People have, I don't think there's a person on earth that's not come across the three stripes or not heard the name. But then when many major brands are entering into this space, there is oftentimes a very often false assumption that it is a marketing play while you are saying that you know the the three stripe studio is very much about changing the infrastructure of the company to make sure that this technology is embedded throughout rather than becoming this big experimental play but at the same time have you faced any resistance with you know the long standing followers who may still be a little bit resistant towards this kind of technology? And then how do you bridge that conversation where you can address both sides of this conversation? Yeah, and it comes up in bits and pieces. Like, for, I could tell you right away, like we are, Adidas is a, takes sustainability very seriously. And that was number one um, in the beginning before we moved, you know, I think proof of, proof of work, proof of stake became a big conversation we were having internally, like when's the right time? And how are we gonna be able to offset and what do gas fees mean and how does this impact carbon footprint? That was a big conversation that we'd had um, and really brought along the sustainability team and, and learned from them. They've learned from us. We've been tracking our own footprint to date. Um, it's something that we now report on and it's gonna be in our analyst reports. Some of the other conversations we've had, there have been obviously a lot of talk about how inclusive and representative and, and what's the DEI within this space. I mean, it's pretty, pretty exciting that you have two women on stage and before this you had an all-women panel. We absolutely know that the world that we're living in today is not built with inclusivity as its uh, first principle. And so a lot of what I think Web3 has the ability to do is start to decentralize and give remuneration and ownership back into the hands of creators that might not look like the creators and the people in the history books. And so as a result, we talked a lot about making sure that we're trying to lift up and, and empower others and give a bigger platform to others that don't necessarily have that platform. And Adidas has a really big platform and a very big spotlight. So that, I think, is something that's been really important to us and, and who we associate the label with. It also goes into, uh, God, when we did our first launch, we were two weeks after Facebook changed their name to Meta, if I can take you back into time, which was shocking, shocking at the time, um, how far we've come even to think back, like, okay, where have we been? But... As a, as a moment in pop culture, I think now we're going through another wave because we've had the three arrows and the, the what is it, the FTX debacle. We got, we're, we're trying to now educate how do we separate from crypto, what's going on with crypto, and some of acknowledging we do need regulation, we do need ethical standards, we need to talk about those sorts of important things in order to set principles and guidelines for how we behave. At the same time, I don't want Adidas and also the NFT collector community and the values that we stand for and are, are wanting to be a part of getting mired into those conversations as well. So we're trying to decouple and do the part that we can um, to help bring more people into the space, education in the space, and help the popular culture acknowledge that those are different value propositions and you know we, we see something more beautiful going on in Web3. So in many ways, Adidas is advertently or inadvertently positioned itself as a bit of a spokesperson and a brand role model because it's finding itself, whether it likes it or not, immersed in the conversations and talking about the technology and taking over the education, not just internally to the company, but externally to the world. And of course, the reputation of it being, you know, the, or the original collaborator brand very much comes into play here. So talk about how the relationship with collaborators changed and you know what did collaboration look like in a decentralized fashion once you started interacting with blockchain technology i don't even think we've scratched the surface of it to be honest i think we're just now getting to put our focus there because we had to put some of the building blocks in place first i think it's spider-man that has the quote with great responsibility what is it with great with great power, power comes, comes great, great respons responsibility adidas we feel that we feel that very much um because we were really early we are a very big brand, and so everyone really does look at us. I know we're being used as case studies for a lot of boardrooms, a lot of agencies, a lot of uh, other people's go-to-market planning, and so it was incredibly important for us to make steps all along the way that were incredibly respective and paid values back into what Web3 is trying to do and the movement behind Web3. 
Um, it's also part of the reasons why if you look at the smart contracts and you look at how much our take rate was compared to our partnerships, it's, it's a true partnership. It was equal. We really had equal stakes in the relationships. We've had to put some foundations in place. We had to get our house in order. We had to hire a pretty robust team, so we have quite a few of those folks here today. We had to get stood up our Discord community, and we're starting to put some organizational rails around the Discord community. I'm not going to call it a DAO, but you could maybe hint it's a step two movements like that because we've launched the Three Stripes Council. So now there's a group of 15 people. They're going to represent the voice of the community and help to bring that forward. Now I think we really get to play with creating decentralized models. And yes, Adidas is the original collaborator brand, right? If you look at, um, I don't know if this is public information, but I believe you know, like Beyonce said she wanted to work with Adidas because of seeing you know, the, the, the Kanye West's success, his individual success, and how he was able to supercharge his creative vision through his partnership with Adidas is just an example. But now, we don't want to just work with the Pharrells and the Beyonce's and the Bad Bunnies and the Yeezys of the world. We're now thinking about, okay, how can we help the community become the next Yeezy, become the next Ivy Park, become the next human race? And so that's the thing that we're going to start shifting our focus to this year. You'll start to see us putting some propositions out there, and, and I think we're calling it phase three, and the community's really waiting for phase three. We've called it identity. Identity really breaks down into a couple things. You need something to represent yourself, and I think people right now expect that to be a profile picture project. And the second thing identity means is ownership. And so we're going to be really looking at how we can bake ownership into some of our models going forward and the projects that we're going to be putting out there for the community to participate in. Um, and also looking at blockchain, you can give remuneration in some of those projects. So we'll be looking at what's possible this year. And I like, it, I like the shift in model when it comes to collaborators in terms of, I think most major brands tended to veer towards the celebrity route, the A-listers, and then because of the grassroots movements that's very much embedded throughout blockchain culture, whether, whether you're on Tezos, whether you're on Ethereum, whether you're on Polygon, Solana, it really doesn't matter. There is this grit to the community and this voracious appetite for, for growth and support. So to directly participate in that is a beautiful thing. But then, you know, with every exciting opportunity comes challenge, and we've only actually got about two minutes on the clock, but I'd like to ask what the biggest challenge you've faced is and sort of how you've tried to overcome that or have overcome that. Yeah. I think we're a bit of renegades inside a 75-year-old established company. And um, we're at a time where definitely the first year and a half of this project, we leveraged the mystique Web3 had to get some cool shit made inside a very structured, process-driven organization. I think now we're at a time where you're in the market that is no longer the bull run. You need to really make sure that you have a business plan attached to justify to the controller and the CFO office why we're doing what we're doing. And so as belief starts to wane as, you know, not just the Web3 markets down, not just NFTs and trading, but let's be honest, like even my stocks are down. All of tech has been down, what, 40 plus percent this year. So it's a tough market. I don't know if Biden would say we're in a recession, but I think we all agree we're looking at a global recession right now and we feel like we're living in that. So the, the whole industry is taking a breath. Um, I think all of the capital markets are taking a breath right now, and that means it's putting a lot of pressure on us to make sure we're finding profitable business models. And there's not a lot of case studies. There's not a lot of playbooks, to be honest, in the space for, okay, how are you moving from your primary mint where you're maybe generating some upfront capital investment that you can then repurpose. You know, Yuga Labs had to raise some money. Quite a few of the successful projects have gone out and had to raise. You know, Adidas isn't going to be going out and doing a raise, <laughs> right? That's, that's not how we've established this project. So now the pivot is for us to find new models. Number one, we want to stay true to the values of giving back to the community and evolving the community. And that for us, there's over 30,000 token holders. And we look at them as our stakeholders. Those are people who decided to go on this journey with us. So we want to bring them along, but we also need to find new models that are going to be an invitation for other people to want to hold tokens. And also, we use this word utility a lot. And I think it's super vague, but unpacking what are the types of utilities, access, uh, token-gated access, maybe limited edition products, really specialized products that people can get access to. And so we're trying to really figure out with a brand like Adidas with stretch and reach, what can we do next? Um, 
I think a lot of people don't even know, like the, the ITM tracksuit that was exclusively avail available for token holders was made by a suitor who worked on Seville Row. So if you see someone wearing these, like take a look at the suiting and the design that's gone into this. This isn't from the Adidas machine. Uh, necessarily, but we're trying to position ourselves in the company as doing things at the forefront and leveraging virtual and digital experiences in a way that can help future-proof their business model. And so that absolutely is landing well with people. We're doing some pilots I can't talk about yet, but you'll start to see them roll out and you'll see, oh, that's interesting. Adidas has been playing with... Uh, secret, secret, secret. Secret, the <laughs> enter thing here. But that's what this team gets to do, and we want to bring it to the community first. So um, I will say announcements will always start in the Discord, start with the Three Stripes Council, um, and that's the way to, to keep following our journey. So a lot of plans in the works. Adidas is 100% a brand to watch. I mean, it always has been. And I love what you said about, you know, in a bear market, a recession, whether you're in crypto or whether you're in tech stocks, whatever it is, everyone's feeling a bit of a pinch, but that isn't to mean that any of us are actually paralyzed. There's still plenty of room for movement and there's plenty of room for growth and we need to embrace that. Yes, and I'll make one announcement because I think um, it's, it, it's really important too, we get together IRL. I think events like this, conferences like this are super important for people to come together to share ideas, to shake hands, right? To find a common understanding and start working together. Um, we're going to be doing our first ever community event. It's going to take place in Berlin. It was voted for by the community. So all of us as a team are going to show up. Um, they're all waiting for when. When, when, when. So March 25th is when. So we will see you on March 25th. I hope the community will join us. Um, if you're curious, also follow along. We have a Twitter handle. Uh, Indigo Hertz is the name of our Twitter handle. That's our, our moniker of our board ape that represents us uh, as a team. And yeah, I think we're just excited to keep going on this journey, but also very much acknowledge this is, this is a journey. Um, and it really does require that we all work together and collaborate. So, you know, thanks for inviting Adidas into this space today. Really honored to be here. Well, there you go, everyone. March 25th in Berlin, noted on your calendars. Erica, thank you so much again. And if you have any questions, come find us later.